Welcome back to ECE 442-542. In this session, we're actually going to be talking about how do we translate these desired transfer functions or performance specifications into S or S-plane pole locations and consequently Z-plane pole locations. We want to be able to transfer specifications like settling time, percent overshoot, peak time into Z-plane pole locations so that we can now determine a desired T sub C of Z so that we get the behavior that we want between the reference input R and the output Y. The whole point being that if we can now achieve a T sub C of Z that we desire by the proper selection of a controller, then we would have had our controller design achieved. So what performance is needed from T sub C of Z? That's all going to be determined by this relationship between performance specifications and pole locations. We'll first talk about it for the analog setting and in particular we're going to talk about the underdamped second order system which I've now parameterized in two different ways for capital T sub C of S. One is in terms of a natural frequency omega sub n and a damping ratio zeta and the other parameterization the far right is in terms of sigma which really tells us what is the real component of our poles in the complex S plane and omega sub d which is the damped frequency of oscillation what's the vertical component of our poles in the S plane. This now because we're dealing with an underdamped we're assuming we have a real and an imaginary component that gives us oscillatory behavior in our response that's associated with complex poles. And one thing that I might note is if you want a little bit more or a different perspective, you might look in chapter or in section 5.3 in our course textbook. And that's now available as an ebook on or through the D2L site through the U of A library. Relative to this parameterization, the poles now can be plotted. We're again assuming that they're complex. They have a real part, which it's now minus sigma into the left half complex S plane. We're looking at the S plane now. And the vertical distance from the real axis is given by omega sub d. The distance that pole is from the origin in the complex S plane is our natural frequency omega sub n. You'll hear me talk about the hypotenuse that of this right triangle. Hopefully you can now envision or sort of see this right triangle. That now has a hypotenuse that's consistent with the natural frequency omega sub n. It has a horizontal component that is now consistent with the damping or the sigma value and the vertical component is given by omega sub d and that actually influences the frequency of our oscillation or the damped frequency of oscillation. That parameterization again is either in the form of natural frequency and damping ratio or real part and imaginary part of the complex poles. And I've tried to show that here in this diagram for the S plane. I have the real part and the imaginary part that gives us our coordinate axes. We have sigma which can also be described as zeta omega sub n. Omega sub d is actually going to be the hypotenuse times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. And you can do your trigonometry or your geometry to determine that oh if the 
horizontal side of this right triangle is sigma, which is zeta omega sub n, and the hypotenuse is omega sub n, you know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where in this case you could say a squared is sigma squared, c squared is omega sub n squared, you can now solve for b, that gives you the omega sub d, and that ends up being omega sub n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. That's where those expressions are originating from. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is the damping, which I might call sigma, or I might say, oh, the damping ratio zeta. That all now can, if you adjust zeta, you can say, oh, if zeta is equal to zero, then I do not have any real component or my pole is right on the imaginary axis. If zeta, the damping ratio, is equal to 1, now this pole has migrated all the way down and has become purely real and its conjugate has rotated up so that now if you had two poles with zeta values equal to 1, you now have two real poles that are at a distance, omega sub n, away from the origin. And if you had zeta somewhere between 0 and 1, then you are going to have complex poles that have a real component and an imaginary component. The terminology that will be used is sigma is the real component of our complex pole pair and we'll call that the damping. Zeta is the damping ratio, and if you look at taking the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, if you look at zeta omega sub n over the hypotenuse, that gives you zeta. So you're looking at the real part, the real component, the distance of the real part over the hypotenuse, that gives you zeta, and you can also see that that's related to this angle theta that I've illustrated in the diagram. Or you could say, oh, if I wanted to, I could say something like, what's the cosine of theta? Well, the cosine of theta is adjacent, which is zeta omega sub n over hypotenuse, or that's zeta. That means then uh, that if somebody gives you zeta, they're really telling you the angle that that pole makes with the horizontal real axis. Or theta now is this inverse cosine of zeta. The natural frequency, omega sub n, is the magnitude of the value of s, or it's the hypotenuse, it's the distance that pole is away from the origin in the complex s plane and again omega sub d is the vertical component and that's the damped frequency there's a difference if zeta is not equal to 0 or 1 this omega sub n the natural frequency is damped by zeta so your damped frequency the vertical component of your pole is now called the damped frequency and that's a scaled version of omega sub n and the scaling factor is this square root of 1 minus zeta squared and again you can derive all of that from this triangular right triangle relationship where zeta is relating the damping factor involved and omega sub n is the hypotenuse. You can now for this transfer function, a pure two-pole system, there's no zeros, no finite zeros in this transfer function, you can now derive the step response and the step response for that system will now have some oscillatory behavior, some ringing, meaning it overshoots the final value, y sub fv is the final value, of our response. That's where we're settling. After we pass through our settling time, we reach a peak value at t sub p, and that's our maximum value of the output response y, 
how long does it take before this wiggling response gets inside a 1% tube centered around the final value. That's what we call our 1% settling time. All of these values, the peak value or the maximum value of y, which occurs at the peak time, t sub p, the settling time, which is in fact equal to 5 tau, and I'll show that in just a minute, that's when we get within this 1% tube, and then what is our final value that the output settles at as a result of applying a step input to this system. Where does this 5 tau come from? Well, our response, the decay, is given by e to the minus t over tau. And you'll actually also see this sometimes written e to the minus sigma t. You'll see that when the ha when you have e to the st and the real part is sigma, you now have e to the minus sigma t. Hopefully you can now see the relationship between sigma and tau. Sigma is now 1 over tau, or tau is 1 over sigma. So if you're given one, you know the other. If you know sigma, the real component of your pole, then you know what the time constant is tau. If you look at the time t, when t is equal to 5 time constants, you substitute 5 tau in for t, you end up with e is equal, I'm sorry, the value is equal to e to the minus 5 tau over tau. The tau's cancel, and you're left with e to the minus 5, which ends up being 0 0.0067, which you can see is less than 0 0.01, and here is our 1%. So it's an approximation. It's a it's a better value in terms of size than 1%, but 5 tau is a convenient number to keep track of. So the 1% settling time is then consistent with 5 time constants, and that's what we will agree is our settling time. Let's now see if we can translate some of these time domain performance specs of settling time, 1%, Percent overshoot, how much do we overshoot our final value? That's determined y, by y max and y final value. And how quickly do we reach that peak? What's our peak time? Given those performance specifications, let's now translate those into S domain pole locations in this second order pure two pole system. Again, we have e to the minus t over tau is e to the minus sigma t. You'll see that several different, or see that written those ways all the time. Our 1% settling time, we said, was 5 tau. That's what we're agreeing to call it. That's 5 over sigma. So now, if somebody gives you a settling time value, they say 2 seconds, now you can solve for sigma, how far into the left half plane do you need those poles to be? Well, that's now just 5 divided by two set or the settling time, t settle. And if t was 2, then you know that you need your poles to be at least 2.5 units into the complex left half plane. So, if that's the case, let's look at what we can do relative to statements on the behavior based on two different sets of poles, one having a real part of sigma 1 and another having a part of sigma sub 2. So in this case, let's compare the response of a system that has poles that are located at the red locations and another system that has poles represented at the blue location. So now we're saying we have a blue plant and we have a red plant, and we want to compare those. So in this case, sigma sub 2 produces a blank system response versus sigma sub 1 system. And here the blank I'm wanting produces a slower system response, a 
equal system response or a faster system response. So now based on what we know in terms of settling time specification and sigma value, we're trying to translate settling time into real pole location or real component pole values. Sigma sub 2 now produces what? And let's say that faster is a thumbs up, equal is a horizontal thumb, and slower is a thumbs down. I want you now to look in the mirror and be honest with yourself. Answer that question. Sigma sub 2 produces what? At the count of three, I want you to tell me your answer. One, two, three. Hopefully, you were now going to say, or had a thumbs up, Sigma sub 2 is a faster responding system because it has a larger absolute value of real component. It's e to the, so if you looked at this, e to the minus Sigma sub 2t versus e to the minus Sigma 1t, for the same value of t, if Sigma sub 2 is bigger than Sigma sub 1, this value is going to be smaller than that value, so that system is responding faster than the blue system. If somebody now specifies T-settle, they'll give you a sigma, or that translates into a real component part, or if you're looking at this S-plane, I might say, oh, it gives you a vertical line you now need to be to the left of some vertical line that's specified by this settling time specification. The faster your system needs to be, the further that vertical line needs to be into the complex S-plane. What about percent overshoot? Here's the definition of percent overshoot. You take the maximum value of Y, compare that with the final value, so what's that difference, and divide by the final value, multiply by 100%, and that gives you your percent overshoot of your system response. Back here, you can now see that if Y max was really big, you would have a bigger percent overshoot. A 50% overshoot, let's say that your final value was 10, then you would have gone to 15 at Y max and before you settled at a final value of 10. That's now the percent overshoot. You can also show for that particular parameterized second order system in terms of zeta and omega sub n, excuse me, you can find that the percent overshoot is 100 e to the minus zeta pi over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So what's the, what that is actually saying is when somebody now talks about percent overshoot, that translates into a requirement on the damping ratio. You now know something about the damping ratio relative to this perform percent overshoot specification. If this is the relationship between percent overshoot and zeta, you can actually solve that for zeta and you end up with the following expression. Zeta now, for a given percent overshoot, you can calculate by taking, and this is now the natural log, this isn't log base 10, this is natural log of percent overshoot over 100. If you had a percent overshoot of 20, you would put 20 over 100, so now you have natural log of 0.2 and you square that. Then you divide that by pi squared plus natural log of that quantity squared. Pi squared, I'm not sure if you've looked at that recently, but that's roughly 10. So now in terms of zeta, you can calculate a zeta for a given percent overshoot, and you'll see in many different textbooks the plot of this relationship between percent overshoot and zeta, and it gives you this downward curve, which really shows you that as zeta gets bigger, as zeta approaches 1, 
Remember what's happening in the poles? The poles now, as zeta approaches 1, are going down. Your angle is getting smaller, and now you have a smaller imaginary component of those roots for the relative size of the real component and the corresponding percent overshoot is less. So if you want less overshoot, percent overshoot, you want that zeta value to be bigger, you want that angle theta to be smaller, the wedge is actually smaller in the complex s-plane. And that's what I'm trying to show here. Zeta 1 corresponds to a smaller value of zeta. It's obviously closer to 0 than zeta 2 is in this picture. And for that reason, then, you have this relationship on value of zeta and percent overshoot. The percent overshoot decreases as you increase zeta from 0 up to 1. Again, just as a reminder, let's go ahead and show that for zeta and omega sub n, the distance this these poles are, so I have one set of pole pairs and I'm not drawing its twin conjugate down below the s-plane or on the lower half of the complex s-plane. But now, hopefully, you can see that theta, or maybe it's cleaner to talk about cosine of theta, cosine of theta is now zeta omega sub n over the hypotenuse, or that's equal to zeta. And now we can say, oh, theta, if we wanted it, if somebody gave us zeta, zeta which is the damping ratio, and how would they do that? they might give you a percent overshoot. They give you a percent overshoot. You can compute the zeta value. You can now take the inverse cosine of that zeta and determine what the angle theta needs to be. So if you now want a particular percent overshoot, you can calculate the zeta value associated with that percent overshoot, translate that into an angle, and you now know what angle those poles need to make with respect to the negative real axis. You might be wondering, well, I've got 90 different possibilities if I just stepped in one degree increments from 90 degrees all the way down to zero degrees. Is there a nice value? Is there a Goldilocks value? And a nice value is actually zeta equal to 0 0.7. And if you remember cosine of 45, that's 0 0.707. So now an angle of 45 degrees does correspond to a nice value of zeta. And if somebody says, well, I don't know what my percent overshoot or what my zeta value needs to be, well, a zeta value of 0.7, if you go back here, you'll see that that corresponds to a percent overshoot of 5%. So you don't get a lot of overshoot, and you get a pretty fast response out of that. So now what I want you to do is, again, another question. I want you to tell me, based on this picture, you have zeta 1 corresponding to theta 1, big angle theta 1. You have a zeta sub 2, a larger zeta sub 2, it's larger and getting closer to zeta equal to 1, corresponding to a smaller angle theta sub 2. I now want you to complete the following sentence. Theta sub 2 produces blank overshoot than theta 1. And here I'm looking at more, less, or the same. So more would be a thumbs up. Less would be a thumbs down, and the same would be a horizontal thumb. Theta sub 2 in this picture, relative to theta 1, theta sub 2, the system determined by theta sub 2 produces what kind of behavior? In this case, produces more overshoot, 
produces the same overshoot or produces less overshoot than the system associated with theta 1. The count of three, I want you to say thumbs up for more, same horizontal thumb, and down thumb for less. One, two, three. What thumb is staring back at you in the mirror? I hope that you actually had a thumbs down because now theta sub 2 is a smaller angle. The angle being smaller means we have less overshoot versus the system, the second order system that would be associated with an angle of theta sub 1. So now what have we done? Now we've translated percent overshoot into zeta which is another way of saying an angle. So if somebody now tells you a percent overshoot, they're really talking about the angle that those poles make with the negative real axis in the complex S-plane. What about peak time? Well, peak time actually corresponds to the last parameter available to us. We've talked about zeta, we've talked about sigma, now we're going to talk about omega sub d, the damped frequency of oscillation, so if somebody gave you omega sub d, you could compute time to peak from this relationship. And that relationship is really found by looking at the step response expression written in a parameterized form in terms of omega sub n and zeta. Take the derivative of that and find where the derivative is zero for the first time, and that's the peak time. You solve for that peak time and you end up finding that that equals pi over omega sub d. Again, omega sub d is omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared. If somebody now gave you the imaginary component of the complex pole pair, you could determine the peak time. Or if somebody now said, no, I have a time domain peak time to tell you, that now allows you to compute the desired omega sub d, the vertical component of your complex poles. Now we just solve that for omega sub d, and that's now our relationship that we're interested in. If somebody tells you, I want a peak time of this amount. Omega sub d again is the distance that complex pole makes with respect to or away from the horizontal real axis. Omega sub d1 is less than omega sub d2. So the system in red has a smaller omega sub d1 than the system in blue. I'm not drawing their conjugates below the complex or below the real axis in the complex S-plane. I now know that if somebody specifies a T sub P, I can translate that into an omega sub D based on this relationship. If that's the case, now I want you to tell me omega sub D sub 2, that system produces a blank system than omega sub D1. So what does omega sub d2 produce? Does it produce a faster system? Does it reach its peak sooner? Or does the red system associated with omega sub d1 peak sooner? So here I'm interested in omega sub d2 produces a faster, slower, or same system peak time than omega sub d1. Omega sub d1 is bigger, so now if we look at this relationship, if omega sub d1 is bigger, I'm sorry, if omega sub d sub 2 is bigger than omega sub d sub 1, then I hope you can see that a larger number divided into pi gives you a smaller t sub p. A smaller time to peak now says that Omega sub d sub 2 produces a faster system, or a what? A smaller, 
or a larger peak time. If the system is faster, that means that the peak time is actually smaller. And what's the corresponding relationship then between time to peak 2 and time to peak 1? We just circled it. Now we know that time to peak 2 is less than time to peak 1 for these two systems. And that's all based on if you want your system to be faster or have a smaller peak time, then you need to make your imaginary component of those poles in the complex S-plane further away from the real axis. Now you know or have been shown the relationship between performance specifications and pole locations in the complex S-plane. Well, this class isn't the analog class. This is the digital controls class. We need to now convert those S-plane locations into Z-plane locations. We now want to translate the settling time, peak time, and percent overshoot specifications into Z-plane pole locations. And we can do that by what we already know. We already know this relationship. We already know that z is equal to e to the st. And we can parameterize s in terms of its real component, minus sigma, and its imaginary component, omega sub d. If we now put this into s, we can now parameterize our z expression, or the z pole locations, in terms of sigma, omega sub d, or zeta, and omega sub n. Either one. So now this value, zeta, omega sub n, is the real part in the complex S-plane. That's our sigma. This omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta square to remember that's just this right triangle and that's the vertical distance that we were calling omega sub d our damped frequency of oscillation. If we now distribute that sample period t onto both terms and split this into two explicit factors that are exponential factors, hopefully you can see that this one is now omega sub d times t, but we'll just call that theta sub d. This is now e to the j theta sub d, and this now is, if you look at Euler, that has a magnitude of 1, so the magnitude of your complex poles, z, are going to be determined by this e to the minus zeta omega sub n t factor or the e to the minus sigma t factor. Here's our radius and here is our angle theta sub d. So we now have r e to the j omega sub d t. This again is theta sub d. This is not the same theta in the s plane. This is now the theta in the z plane and that's theta sub d. You could also look at this by using Euler. You can take this and now just use Euler's relationship and say, oh, r cosine theta sub d plus j r sine theta sub d, that gives me now the rectangular form of this location in the complex z plane and this now allows us to determine, based on zeta, the damping ratio, sigma, the damping, and the damped frequency, omega sub d, what that looks like in terms of shape in the complex z-plane. And that's what we want to do now. We want to now, here's just a diagram of the z-plane relative to its polar form, r theta sub d, and its rectangular form, those poles are now a distance into the right half plane of x bar, which is r cosine theta sub d, and you didn't think you would ever use your trigonometry again. Now you're using it. And the vertical distance, 
is R sine of theta sub d. You can now parameterize those poles in polar form or rectangular form. If somebody gives you poles, you can now measure those locations, or if they give you the specifications in polar form or rectangular form, you now know how to convert those around. Let's now look at how those S-plane locations translate into the Z-plane. Again, what were we thinking about with respect to 1% settling time? Well, 1% settling time corresponded in the S-plane to these sigma values. Where do these blue and red vertical lines, how do they translate over into the Z-plane? Well, they translate over based on this relationship between S and Z. Z is equal to e to the ST. If you now replace S with these values of sigma 1 and sigma sub 2, here we're allowing the imaginary component to be anything from 0 up to infinity you'll see that the sigma value, sigma 1, is closer to the imaginary axis. It's smaller so that e to the minus sigma 1t is bigger than if sigma sub 2 is a bigger number, e to the minus sigma sub 2t, e to the minus bigger exponent is smaller. We now have a concentric ring picture ver in the z-plane versus a vertical line in the S-plane. So these vertical lines in the S-plane, which are corresponding to 1% settling time, translate into concentric circles or a bullseye picture in the Z-plane. We now have two different circles. We have an R1 circle, e to the minus sigma 1t, and an R2 circle, e to the minus sigma sub 2t. The smaller circle corresponds to a faster or slower system. And you could say, well, I can figure out what fast and slow is in the S-plane. Well, if that's the case, then translate that into the Z-plane. Is a smaller circle, which in this case is R sub 2, is that a faster system or a slower system than the system associated with poles that might live anywhere on that circle with a radius of capital R sub 1. So now we're viewing poles, complex poles, either on R sub 2's radius or on R sub 1's radius. Smaller circle translates into, and in this case, smaller collapses faster, say r sub 2 squared, r sub 2 cubed. You've done this before. This now gives you a faster system. If that's the case, now you know that r sub 2 is faster and r sub 1, which is a larger circle, is slower. If somebody now gives you a settling time spec, that translates into a circle in the z-plane. And now we have this geometric shape in the z-plane corresponding to settling time. Somebody gives you a settling time spec, that translates into a circle. So now let me see if we can find where we left off. Here's where we left off. The 1% settling time, given t settle, let's find the radius associated with that. Well, we can let t settle be a number, or it could be a certain number of sample periods. Let's say that it's a certain number of sample periods, capital T, where now we're going to assume our settling time is, let's say, 10 samples. So capital N sub s would be 10 or if we know t sub settle, then we could solve for n sub s. Again, the 1% settling time we know in a discrete time system is x at time n sub s. We're not worrying about the sample period t. We're just saying after n sub s samples, r n sub s times the initial value is going to be where we're at, and we want for that to be 1% of where we started.
we can cancel out the initial conditions and we now have this relationship that relates R to the number of samples to settle within 1%. We can now solve that for R in terms of N sub S. The log of base 10 of 0.01 is minus 2. That gives us log base 10 of R. The radius is minus 2 over N sub S. Or we could now back that around and solve for R. We raise both sides or we use the exponent of in both sides so that now we have 10 raised to the log base 10 of R. That gives us R is equal to 10 to the minus 2 over N sub S. So we just take the anti-log of both sides. If somebody now gives us the number of samples, that gives us R. In other words, if somebody said, I want a 1% settling time to occur in 60 samples, you plug that N sub S into the expression for R and you end up now with 1 over 10 to the 1 over 30th and that's bigger than 0 so this is a number larger than 1 in the denominator and that's going to give you now some number that's less than 1 and it's going to be pretty close to 1 because it's taking you 60 samples to settle and in that case you know that your settling time specification of 60 samples would be accomplished if your closed loop poles are inside a radius of 0.926 in the complex C plane. Let's keep going. We now know settling time translates into circles. Percent overshoot, what was that? Well that actually was consistent with this zeta value or that made us think of the damping ratio for a fixed zeta what happens to Z? If we fix zeta so percent overshoot corresponds in the S plane remember to an angle theta which corresponds to a zeta so this is now when you hear percent overshoot you start thinking damping ratio well, let's now look at what Z does if we fix the damping ratio. In the S plane, that corresponded to these angles. What shape does it correspond to in the Z plane? Again, Z is E to the ST, E to the parameterized form of S times T. Let's write it in terms of zeta and omega sub N. We have R and we have theta sub D. Oh boy, zeta is in both of these. So if we keep zeta fixed, let's just say zeta was 0.7. Now the only parameter in our sample period capital T has been specified. The only parameter that we can vary is now omega sub n, the natural frequency. What if we vary the natural frequency and let's look at what happens to R. So if R is equal to the radius of these complex poles, e to the minus zeta omega sub n t, zeta is fixed, t is fixed, and let's say we increase omega sub n. What happens to R as, let's say, as omega sub n increases? Does R get bigger or does R get smaller? Well, omega sub n is in a negative exponent. Zeta and t are fixed. The only way that r is going to change is r is going to decrease as the natural frequency increases. What about theta sub d? Well, theta sub d is now associated with this. So maybe I should have, this is now theta sub d. Should have done it that way. Theta sub d is equal to omega sub n t square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So now if, let's say again, as omega sub n increases, what happens to theta sub d? Zeta is fixed, 
t is fixed. So this t times the square root of 1 minus theta squared, that's just a number. We're increasing theta sub d. What happens? I'm sorry, we're increasing omega sub n. I'm getting ahead of myself. Theta sub d increases. So now we know what r and theta sub d do simultaneously when zeta is fixed in this parameterized form in the z-plane for these closed-loop poles. The radius r gets smaller and the angle theta sub d gets larger as omega sub n increases. We have these two things happening at the same time. And now can you picture what that looks like in the z-plane? Here's the z-plane. Let's say we start at 1 and now we start increasing omega sub n and keeping zeta fixed. Well that's saying that the radius gets smaller so we're getting closer to the origin as the angle theta sub d gets larger. As theta sub d gets larger, that's this, and r gets smaller, that's this. So if we vary those at the same time, we actually get a curve that's described as a logarithmic spiral. This, this curve is associated with a fixed damping ratio. And we moved along that curve as omega sub n increased. So now when somebody gives you a percent overshoot, that translates into a zeta. Remember that curve that was going like this where here's the percent overshoot and here's zeta. It doesn't go down to zero, but it's like this. Somebody gives you percent overshoot. That now translates into a zeta value. Percent overshoot, zeta. And what does that mean in the z-plane? Well, a percent overshoot gives you a fixed zeta. That gives you a logarithmic spiral. Or if you use your imagination, hopefully you can see that that kind of looks like a heart. So now that gives you another shape. And I better keep that red since a heart you usually think of as red. So now that gives you a heart shape. And for different values of zeta, that's going to collapse that heart or make it a little bit smaller in terms of size. A, a big heart would be zeta equal to zero. That's the unit circle. As you get smaller in your heart, as your damping ratio gets bigger, your percent overshoot gets smaller and your heart gets smaller. So now we have settling time our circles percent overshoot our hearts, what's the peak time going to be? I feel like we're eating a breakfast cereal. We have circles and hearts. What are we going to continue to eat relative to peak time? Let's see. So peak time again was associated in the s-plane with this vertical distance omega sub d of the complex poles. Omega sub d is omega sub n square root of 1 minus theta squared. Theta sub d is omega sub dt. And we want to know if omega sub d is fixed, theta sub d is, well, if omega sub d is fixed, theta sub d is also fixed. And theta sub d is just an angle. Well, theta sub d is this angle here in the complex z-plane. This is now theta sub d. Remember our poles were living here at some r e to the j theta sub d. And this might be r1. And this might be r2 e to the j theta sub d. And this might be r sub 0 e to the j theta sub d. We can vary the r. Theta sub d is omega sub d t. And what shape is that? Well now just sort of think of that here. 
That's either an angle or you could call it a wedge. Now, R can vary. Peak time is omega sub D. That now translates into a wedge in the z-plane or an angle. And again, this theta sub d is not the same as the theta in the s-plane. Theta in the s-plane corresponds to the percent overshoot. This theta sub d actually con corresponds to omega sub d. So if you want a bigger peak time, I'm sorry, if you want a faster system, a smaller peak time, then you need a bigger omega sub d, remember, if you want a bigger omega sub d, that gives you a bigger angle, and now for a faster system, you want theta sub d to be bigger angle-wise relative to this horizontal real axis. We'll pick up at that point in terms of these breakfast cereal shapes. We now have circles, hearts, and wedges. And those correspond to, hopefully I can get this in the right order, settling time, percent overshoot, and what's the last one? Peak time, so speed of response. We have circles, hearts, and wedges corresponding to settling time, percent overshoot, and peak time. We'll pick up there next time.